Hello everyone and welcome to Your Health, Your Choice. I am Dr. Robin Rukunarayan and we are coming to you live from our studios at Olira Heights in San Fernando. Today is Wednesday, 12th of April, 2023. And on tonight's program, we're going to be discussing family medicine with a little slant towards women's health. In studio with me tonight is Dr. Renata Ramsewak-Lala. Dr. Ramsewak-Lala is a general practitioner based in San Fernando. As usual tonight, guys, our numbers should come up at the bottom of your screens, and we'll do our very best to answer each and every one of your questions during the program. So guys, it's a live program tonight. It's Wednesday, 12th of April, 2023. I'm here with Dr. Ramsrak Lala. We're talking about family medicine, something that we really haven't discussed in, in detail yet on this program, and with a little slant towards women's health. So guys, feel free to join in on the discussion. We'll be taking your questions and your comments and be answering it in the final segment of the program. So guys, we'd just like to welcome to our studios, Dr. Ramsrak Lala. Doc, welcome to, this, welcome to your health, your choice. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, Renata. You're very welcome. So, Renata, um, we're just going to throw you into the deep end immediately. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's, I mean, I, I know you're a GP in the area. Um, you have a lot of history um, working in anesthetics as well in the hospital. Yes. I know you work with a certain women's organization. I think it's the yes. International yes. Organization yes. as well. And I know you have a real focus towards women's health and a real interest in women's health and, and, in, and female health, young, young, young females as well. So I suppose the, the, the logical question is, um, what do you, as a female general practitioner in this field, consider to be the major challenges, health challenges, facing uh, teenage girls and young adult women in Trinidad and Tobago in 2023? What's the biggest challenges facing our young women? Well, health that's, challenges. That's a great question. <clears throat> it's one that I think teenagers are yeah. often overlooked in our population. Yes. Where there's a lot of emphasis on children. And yes. of course, you know, children come to the doctor quite often for their yes. vaccines and their wellness visits. Yes. But somehow the teenagers sort of get left behind after they start secondary school. Mm -hmm. And with teenagers, especially girls, mm -hmm. to me a major problem and what I've been seeing in my office now mm -hmm. is severe anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. um, we also see mental things health. like mental health issues, mm -hmm. mental health for sure, mm -hmm. eating disorders, mm -hmm. and I'm also seeing a lot of things like menstrual abnormalities. Menstrual abnormalities. And I think that they're all actually interlinked. Okay, okay so um, I mean those would be common illnesses that you'd see in your office, right? Yes. Um, in terms of our population scale, what do you see as the um, not just what is coming in, but what is the greatest challenge to it this year and going forward for, for women in terms of healthcare? Um, well, I mean, it will be very more, me more mental health Mental issues. health, def definitely. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, for teenagers, you know, yeah. they are going through so many changes. You have physiological yeah. changes, you yeah. have puberty. Yeah. And in Trinidad, we have a very stressful situation in terms of education. Yeah. So they're thrown into, you have these stressors of SEA. Yeah. Then they go into high school. There's yeah. all of this um, stress to perform and to achieve, yeah. to get into careers. Yeah. So it's a period of a uh, lot of challenges yeah. our teenagers on the whole because of hormonal challenges and so will yeah. have insecurities yeah. but now you have um, insecurities you have all of these stresses and, th and challenges and you think that's worse because of the uh, like the pandemic after the pandemic oh or, definitely or that's a, a consistent problem that you see that you see a consistent health challenge to, for for teenage girls yes but it so, has worsened in and it, uh, definitely because mm -hmm. if you recall prior to the pandemic there mm -hmm. was this all this discussion about too many too much screen time yeah. for children and teenagers yeah. and yes, there yes. was actually trying to be a move away from it Correct. so then of course the pandemic hit and yeah. now we're using screen as education right so now you have kids or teenagers who are now being faced with more and more screen time yeah. so you have things like now you have eating disorders of two types yeah. you have those who have obesity yeah. and obesity is a big challenge for us in Trinidad and Tobago yeah. um, from childhood to yes. the teenage years yes. and actually the World Health Organization has declared this as almost an epidemic in the right. world. And we'll go into that a little bit later on. Actually. Right. Mm -hmm. So with the teenagers now mm -hmm. you find that some of the girls and you know they're faced they're online all the time mm -hmm. so there is there was always this strong um, especially in the Western culture of having this perfect ideal body type okay. of being these slim you know right. trim women that they want to live up right. to and now 
now we introduce social media and see yeah. social media is just growing and growing and right. growing. Right. So now you find women and these girls who have these stereotypes that they're trying to live up to. Okay. So to me, that's one the big, of the, the biggest major, challenges. Major challenges. Um, I would like to contribute to that as well. I think um, I, I thought you'd have also mentioned, although it's not strictly healthcare. I think gender-based violence and crime is something because also they're now re restructuring crime towards a, a public health slant. Yes. Um, yes. Which, is, which is understandable as well because it's a multifactorial cause of crime Definitely. and it's a multifactorial approach and it also does affect health. Uh -huh. So I think um, if I would add in something as well, as well that I think is a major um, challenge for women, I think it would be, and young teenage women, uh, young teenage girls and, and young women, I think um, crime. Crime. as affecting the health definitely um, gender-based violence is a big problem violence against women right so um, you mentioned that i belong to an organization called right so that's my next question <laughs> <laughs> can you um, tell us a little bit about the organization what what is the, um, the full name of the organization what's the what happens in that organization and and you said that you're the president of the south san fernando branch yes um why is what what does a, a female doctor bring to that role? Well, Sir Optimus, I am the president of Sir Optimus International mm. of San Fernando. Right. There are actually seven groups of Sir Optimus in Trinidad. Right. We are a global organization, mm -hmm. so we not only have branches in Trinidad but all over the world. Yeah. In fact, they are the, we are the biggest female organization in the world. Right. And our group, the S S S I T T, we call them Sir Optimus International Trinidad and Tobago, yes. falls under the Federation of Great Britain and, and Ireland right. so we are part of a global group yes. and one of our we follow we have um, consultative status with yes. the United Nations right. so we follow the United Nations um, SG, SDGs yes. and of course women the biggest one of the biggest hazards for women is domestic violence gender-based mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. not only violence but discrimination and mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. so we have a big campaign we are always advocating for women's mm -hmm. rights okay so i mean yes and we have seen where women across the world and mm -hmm. in trinidad and tobago are subject of course to crime mm -hmm. in a disproportionate way mm -hmm. not that it doesn't happen to the men we recognize mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. but women disproportionate to the men mm -hmm. so we are always advocating for women you know mm -hmm. in terms of equality and so and it does mm -hmm. cause a great deal of stress to mm -hmm. young girls I mm -hmm. mean as you said we are always at a threat to yes. violence you know yes. I mean a simple thing like going to your car yes. a guy can easily just pick up himself and go to the car yes. a woman has to make sure she has her keys yes. make sure she has a light yes. make sure she has somebody to accompany her go to have a car if yes. I'm going home I'm going to call my husband yes. and say I'm on my way home and yes. it's these had additional stresses that yeah. you know we have I and whether it's conscious or subconscious you know mm -hmm. women do and young girls <clears throat> so yeah. so a simple thing like maybe they have to go online with their friends you yeah. know so now it will be okay where you're going who you're going with and okay. things along those lines so what what are the major um I understand the organization they explained to us it's yes sort of organization towards the promotion of, of um I suppose the well-being of women. Definitely. Um, what What would you describe as, or what are the major initiatives for the year 2023, and uh, in terms of health, right. and um, why Why is it? What does a doctor contribute to towards that whole scenario as as a lead? Well, is healthcare a big part of the organization's plans? Well, we have different, as we say, as I said, different we follow arms. different SDGs, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we do, we are not just a non-profit organization that would say we give out hampers. No. What we do is we actually do projects. Yeah. And our projects okay. are aimed at enabling, educating, and then empowering women and girls. Yeah. So if we're doing a health project, it will be along the lines of education mainly. Right. But we have had other things like health drives. For example, we had a big health drive last year in collaboration with the Rotary Club of South yes. and we did where we we went to the rural areas of Maruga and we took all of these different healthcare professionals mm -hmm. and had a big fair. Mm -hmm. This year we had a big um, March was Endometriosis Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. So we did a big health campaign with endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Now this is not the first time. We have done many campaigns about endometriosis. Okay. But okay. this year what we did is we had a gynecologist who did some um, 
information for us, which we broadcast on right. Facebook and other social media. Right. And we had a big endometriosis awareness challenge right. on the holiday, Shout of Baptist Day. Right. And it was a phenomenal event because right. we were able to have about 200 people come out and participate in our fun day. Okay. And so it was health-based, right. but it was to bring awareness to something that really affects okay. women and girls, okay. endometriosis. So endometriosis, yes. And mobilization. That's right. Yeah. And we normally have, we will um, celebrate things like breast cancer awareness. So right. usually in October, we do breast cancer campaigns. Mm -hmm. We normally do target things like other women's health issues, like cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So for, our year, for this year, we already started our health issues. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's what I bring to the I organization. Understand. But we are a group of very diverse women. Right. So we have women from all different walks of life. Okay. So it's not just health based right. by any means. I understand. Um, so I just want to touch on something you mentioned a little bit earlier, right? Um, me being a general practitioner myself and working in, have, having worked in many different countries, um, I think a lot of times when we work in other countries, we're very much aware of eating disorders. Yes. And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit there. Yes. Um, it's something I think I think is under-discussed, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if your organization discusses it more. Um, but if you could just educate the audience at home a little bit. Um, Teenage girls, especially, and, and also boys, suffer from eating disorders. Yes. Can you just touch on that, that topic a little bit? Right. <coughs> so, eating disorders, as you said, can affect both men, boys, and girls. Yes. It's more common in girls than right. boys, and the greatest. Pro um, the greatest amount is really between in the teenage years, yeah. right? So between the ages of like 13 to 17. Yeah. And this again corresponds to the changes that's happening. Yeah. Now a lot of people think about eating disorders as it's being only um, about eating when yes. it's not really only about the food. Uh -huh. There's a deeper psychological involvement most times that right. and, you know that that's happening. Right. I actually had a discussion with somebody today and yeah. the person was saying to me, I, I didn't think those things happen in Trinidad. Yeah. To me it's only like um, you're bringing it up. Yeah, it's uh -huh. only a US thing or yeah. you know. But uh, the world is now a global village mm -hmm. and w you know we no longer have things happening like in pockets mm -hmm. so again girls here are being exposed to the same sort of things that are affecting other girls throughout the world yeah. so this image of having the perfect body mm -hmm. so body you know image is a very important factor in a teenage girl's life mm -hmm. and in fact in even young adults mm -hmm. or even throughout they would actually be surprised when I was looking at some of the studies mm -hmm. they thought about body image as being important from even into the older age mm -hmm. you know even in women you know mm -hmm. after menopause mm -hmm. so body image is something that affects all women and mm -hmm. you know men as well but it's greatest in the teenage years mm -hmm. and uh, so normally there would maybe be insecurities about your body image which mm -hmm. can be normal with mm -hmm. puberty mm -hmm. but when this happens to affect the child or the young person so much mm -hmm. so that it's affecting their performance or their activities like being engaged in social activities mm -hmm. then this becomes a problem mm -hmm. so some of the things that you might actually look out for so you would say to pair or parents might bring their child and say they are rapidly losing weight so so is it this distorted image leaves the child to not eat to not eat and is that is that a, is that a spectrum of anorexia and nerv nervous no, nervous so nervoso. you have mm, the two main groups are the anorexia and nervous mm -hmm. and you also have bulimia mm -hmm. so they are both closely linked mm -hmm. and with anorexia what there is is that there is this unhealthy obsession with food or lack of wanting to eat or mm -hmm. always dieting or always every single thing that's going into their mouth you know mm -hmm. it becomes something of a big deal mm -hmm. so parents would notice that their child has a switch in their eating patterns mm -hmm. so what would have been probably a normal healthy appetite now they're just playing around with their food on their plate mm -hmm. not eating as much <coughs> also exercising obsessively mm -hmm. and becoming obsessed with their body image so always weighing themselves always looking at themselves on you know in a mirror mm -hmm. they may also in a, have in a drive towards becoming super, super light super Slim, super slim. Right, yeah. because there is this distorted body image where mm -hmm. they now think that they're never thin enough. Mm -hmm. So I've had children or young people who've mm -hmm. been weighing, le weighing less than 100 pounds mm -hmm. and they still think that they are fat. And mm -hmm. this is what, you know, is a big part of what we call the distorted body image. Mm -hmm. And this is what helps uh, because now these things, of course, can affect all the different systems, you mm -hmm. know, and so you can have, 
you know, significant consequences on the body itself, the physical mm -hmm. parts of the body. Mm -hmm. But a lot of parents will start noticing things, for example, you know, so we may not have that extreme, mm -hmm. but we may have somewhere in between. So yeah. parents start to see this child who was always active is no longer, you know, mm -hmm. willing to take part in social activities, for mm -hmm. example, because they don't want to, their body to be exposed. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to go somewhere where they may have to wear a swimsuit, for example. Mm -hmm. They may be wearing baggy clothes to hide what they look like. They right. might be hiding their face, you know, they're right. not wanting to take pictures. Mm -hmm. So family pictures, they're not interested in. Mm -hmm. So if you as a parent are noticing these things, mm -hmm. along with things like rapid weight loss, mm -hmm. or you find your child is becoming a little bit more um, introverted, mm -hmm. not as active, not as outgoing, then these are certainly things that you need to address to your family doctor, okay. bring your child and have the child ac uh, assessed. All right. so, um, the extreme of that would be anorexia. Yes. Um, and the opposite is? Bulim well, it's not an opposite. Bulimia mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. similar in that. What, what is bulimia? So bulimia is an eating disorder as well. Mm -hmm. And in, in contrast to anorexia, they may be normal body weight mm -hmm. and they may be binge eating, mm -hmm. but they also tend to have vomiting, mm -hmm. you know, so there's guilt associated with the food and there is forced vomiting after. Mm -hmm. So they're all very closely linked right. in terms of So, so this, is a, this is a condition. These are the two main eating disorders. Yes. And there obviously is a spectrum in between. Yes. And sometimes it's hard for, for doctors to diagnose. Definitely. Because it's something that comes from observation by the family. Yes. I think more, yes. and, and, and it's raised with the doctor. Um, it might be a, a psychological cause yes. to, to it, as you say, in self image and body image and distorted images, mm -hmm. self images. And that leads to, to, to the condition which could cause physical um, ill health, yes. which could cause heart problems, could cause anemia, it could cause them to not only perform poorly but actually make them very sick. Definitely. Um, and in some countries, yeah, in some countries where I worked as well, we, sometimes we had to admit patients who were very weak yes. uh, and, and give them treatment for that condition. So am I, right. I re-describing it pretty? Yes, yes, very much so. Right. And I mean, it, it, it's a, also a, a multimodal approach to this. It mm -hmm. should be a team approach. Yes. So you should have, um, you, once you recognize the problem, yeah. you should have a nutritionist involved, yes. um, definitely a psychologist or a yeah. psychotherapist. Yeah. Um, you should get family members involved. <laughs> you should have, you know, school should be involved yeah. because the whole idea is to get this child well right and I mean you know psychotherapy you know people in Trinidad have a very negative um, view sometimes mm -hmm. of things like therapy and mm -hmm. you know but the idea is to now change the whole outlook towards food you know you're making it about nutrition not mm -hmm. about weight um, if it's one thing I think the pandemic did is that it, it made us more aware of how important mental health is Definitely. Um, and that was something that was, as, as previous sources used to say, is a kind of taboo subject. Mm -hmm. People didn't want to hear about mental health. They don't hear you talking about it as a doctor either. Yes. Um, it was a sort of taboo subject. But I think that it, what you are saying is, you know, that, that it's so important, mm -hmm. um, especially the patients that you deal with and, and your organization deals with as well, po yes. positive mental health and proper mental health could really does impact our physical health as well. Right. Um, I, I just want to take a quick break, a uh, sure. quick commercial break, and then um, when we return, we'll have a little bit more of a discussion into that aspect of it, and probably we're going to discuss um, a little bit about the health needs of the elderly women, okay. um, what, what unique um, what unique features or what, what unique um, medical interventions they may, they may need or that you think is lacking right now in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. All right, guys, so um, my name is Dr. Robert McMurray, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Renata uh, Ramsuak Lala. We're just taking a little two minute break, and when we come back, we'll continue on the discussion. All right, guys, so feel free to send in your questions, join the discussion, send in your comments, and help move this uh, program along. Thanks, guys. everyone, I'm Stacy from Stacy's Kitchen. Check out our new episodes, season three of Stacy's Kitchen at our new time, 5.30 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays, right here on ACTN The Voice. I will be whipping you up some flavorful and appetizing dishes. As they say, good food makes a good mood. So guys, stay tuned for this culinary explosion right here on Stacy's Kitchen.
Connect with ACTN The Voice on Facebook or Instagram at ACTN The Voice. ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. guys welcome back we're talking about women's health uh, general practice in community medicine i'm here with my guest dr renata Ramsworth. so Doc, before we went off there we were talking a little bit about eating disorders mental health right and um, i just want to take care a little bit along the especially in teenagers and young adults so they're going to take care a little bit further down the spectrum and um, elderly females let's say yes. that those in uh, over 75 right. right in your observation as a practitioner i mean we all we all have great skills in caring for elderly people men and women but is there any particular gaps that you are seeing or any particular suggestions or points or pearls that you can give the audience out there um, towards focus towards the, the care of the elderly, that's those over 75? Um, what, what, should we, what should caregivers be really uh, focusing on? Okay, so the it's kind of complicated question. I cut <laughs> it up about six ways, but you, you get my well, point. I get your point. Yeah. Um, the elderly actually, you know, starts from over 60. Yes. But, so an advanced but I push it a little, little later down. Because we have some very young elderly people, exactly. right? So nutrition plays an even greater role nutrition. in the elderly. Yeah. And when I speak nutrition, I mean balanced nutrition. So yeah. man maintaining, making sure that they have balanced food groups. Yeah. Now, as you get older, most of elderly people... Of course, this people, is applicable to both men and women. Men and yeah. woman yes Sorry. and in terms of mm -hmm. you know portion sizes mm -hmm. so many times you know the elderly find problems with digestion mm -hmm. they don't they start eating smaller amounts of food mm -hmm. and this can be as a result many people lose their sense of taste mm -hmm. that happens as they get older mm -hmm. and so that's something that we often overlook mm -hmm. and you know you feel like they're just being difficult and they don't want to eat but that's yeah. a major factor yeah. then there's some things like you know changes in dentition is a big a big food oh, yeah, a yeah. big re reason for not yeah. eating properly yeah. so um, I always advise paying attention to the dentition making sure that you go to the dentist regularly yeah. putting proper fitting dentures that's such a very important so, point. yes yeah. and then adapting your meals to suit yeah. so it's no sense you're giving them something that is difficult to chew and swallow they're not yeah. going to be able to handle it yeah. so you have to adjust the meals to suit yeah. so I would say you want to focus on healthy nutrition as in lots of fruits and vegetables yeah. But you can make it uh, so that you can do things like pureed foods. Yeah. You, you should still include carbohydrates and proteins. Yeah. Now, of course, we know that in the elderly, we're going to be dealing with non-communicable diseases. Yeah. So you have those who will have at least one, yeah. maybe diabetes, hypertension, ischemic yeah. heart disease, renal failure. So their diet must be tailored to yeah. the condition that they have. Yeah. But we want to look at that. We want to make sure that we have stay away from all of the fast foods, stay away as much as we can from the processed foods try yeah. to have as much natural foods as possible and make it palatable in terms of adding spices and so and we have a lot of seasonings and so rather than salt because yeah. salt is a major factor for the elderly and send in terms of sending up your blood pressure and so yeah. and you know as you get older you know people lose mobility Correct. they have may have arthritis they're not yeah. able to turn a jar yeah. They're not able to hold a pot. Yeah. They're not able to go out and shop as much as they may able to be able to. Yeah. Their vision may not be as good. So yeah. cooking and preparing meals becomes more of a task. Yeah. So actually getting help from yeah. neighbors, friends, um, you know, your different social groups might be a good idea mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, take some of that burden off of the 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 elderly person mm -hmm. and this way you know you're still maintaining some contact mm -hmm. because loneliness is a major factor Agreed. for the elderly as well next big point there is yes and loneliness which leads to depression and then this affects eating now you yeah. can have overeating but you can also have under eating yeah. and I've had a lot of people say you know it's so hard to cook for just one person yeah. or it's so difficult to sit and have a meal by myself this is the actual patient this is actual the actual patients, patients. Right. yes right. and so you find that you know Trinidad and Tobago used to be very community based mm -hmm. we are moving away now because we have mm -hmm. such fast lifestyles and you know you know people are so busy in their own mm -hmm. worlds but we need to get back to some of that community involvement and getting them back involved and helping the older folks so maybe you know if they can have a meal with the people from their church or the people mm -hmm. in their neighborhood that might help in terms of their actual eating 
Mm -hmm. The other things of consideration, of course, in terms of medical things are things like osteoporosis, mm -hmm. which is in both men and women, but worse mm -hmm. from women mm -hmm. after menopause. So you want to have include elements in your diet, such as calcium. Mm -hmm. And you can get calcium from calcium rich foods. So, mm -hmm. you know, dairy, cheese, um, green leafy vegetables, mm -hmm. things like that. So you want to be aware of that. Okay. Is Exercise, any, of course, as well. Yeah. Is there any sort of um, vitamins or, or supplements that elderly people should be taking? Right. So vitamin D mm -hmm. is an important one. Mm -hmm. Now, we get vitamin D from the sun, but mm -hmm. that's another thing. With COVID and everything else, people mm -hmm. were indoors. Mm -hmm. So you have lower levels of vitamin D. So mm -hmm. now you're finding that rates of osteoporosis and so actually increasing because right. you know you're not being outside yeah. and of course you know that vitamin D in itself has so many benefits yeah. cardiovascular wise it helps with the immunity so vitamin D is a good recommended vitamin mm -hmm. vitamin B is another mm -hmm. good supplement B especially mm -hmm. B12 because it helps with the nervous function mm -hmm. helps with muscle function you know those mm -hmm. the weakness and so that some of the older folks might be experiencing mm -hmm. so um, in general in terms of nutrition I, 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 I laugh at that because I, I hear you, but the um, one of the things that, that you mentioned that I must I must say as well is sometimes I, I tell caregivers, right? Yes. <laughs> because number one complaint, I mean, you're, you're describing elderly people, right? Yes. I mean, number one complaint to hear, or you experience it as a doctor as well, is grumpiness. Yes. Right? <laughs> so that's your hot mouth, right? right? You know, the elderly people that have a real hot mouth or, or they're grumpy, as we right. call it, right? Right. And, um, uh, I was going to ask you why you think that, so, right? but what I normally tell the caregivers or the family is, is um, patience. Mm. Patience is a real important thing. Right. Right? And, and um, why do why, why you think that, that and I'm going to ask you a question I'm going to answer, but why, why do you think, I think, uh, that, that people sometimes have a little bit short, the elderly people with people around them, is because um, a loss of independence. Definitely. And, um, autonomy. Autonomy. Yes. And um, people have the dignity as well. Yes. And you suddenly you have this high functioning female mm -hmm. or male, um, especially females, who have been running the show. Mm -hmm. Right? They're sort of matriarchal people. They were the school teachers, they were looking after the kids, they were looking after their family, they were doing everything. And suddenly they're dependent on somebody else. That's right. And that's a hard thing, isn't it? It is. And you know, so many elderly folks as well, they, they think of themselves as becoming burdens. Yeah. So you hear them saying, I don't want to be a burden to my yeah. family. I, I don't hear that want all the time to be a clinic. burden, you yeah. know. So they come to the doctor's office, they might come by themselves, yeah. and you ask them, well, why didn't you bring somebody with you? Yeah. Because, you know, so many times the information isn't adequate relayed when it's yeah. just yeah, yeah. You, need, you need a younger relative yes yeah. and so they're like they don't want to burden people yeah. you know and there's so many other issues that um, face the elderly I mean finances is a major one that we don't actually ever talk about yeah. so you just said you know they go from somebody who was working yeah. had a big salary yeah. so now you may be getting a p pension may not yeah. be so you're now dependent maybe on other people in your household to yeah. provide so nutrition is one of the things that yeah. suffers because yeah. you you know, you don't want to buy, you know, so many of my patients will say, but you know, doc, my um, vegetables is Mr. Vegetables. It's yeah. so expensive. Yeah. And you know, people in Trinidad, when you tell them that they should eat vegetables and fruit and stuff, they think about foreign based things. Yeah. So they think you're Good talking point. about broccoli and kale and so on. Mm -hmm. But I say to them, you know, go to the market and get mm -hmm. local vegetables. And it's, still reasonably, and it's priced. reasonably yeah, priced yeah. and you can do so much with it. It doesn't yeah. have to be the fancy foods. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the fancy fruits it doesn't have to be the strawberries and berries and stuff which are good yeah. but you can have mangoes you can have citrus you yeah. can have whatever is locally available right so what but coming back to your yeah, point though um our organization, Sir Optimist, we yeah. do have a senior citizen's home, which right. is called Shangri-La, right. and it's in Marabella. Right. And we have about anywhere between 15 to 20 residents. And right. I know exactly what you're saying, because yeah. for some people, it reaches a point where you know that they're not able to manage at home. Yeah. It may not be that they are um, you know, totally bed-bound, yeah. but it might be at a risk for them to stay at home. So yes. their family realizes you know, they can't cook you know, they can't do the activities of daily living yeah. that can sustain them in their homes. So yeah. they need to go to another facility. Yeah. And this in itself creates problems for yeah. them. Because
because of course it's a shift yes. it's a mindset it's a difference you're no yes. longer in your own um, surroundings yeah. and you know you're now you know feeling that you are dependent on other people yeah. and that's such a big loss you yeah. know so there's so many different types of transitions that take place in the elderly and you know I'm sure that all of these things go through their mind you yeah. know they're now they might have started off with a family of six people yeah. and they're down to a family of one yeah. you know so um, it, I, I really do agree with what you're saying, and um, when you explain that data so as well uh, to the audience, you give a lot of um, solutions and suggestions, right? You didn't just describe the, the situation, you give a lot of suggestions and solutions. Yes. And um, one of the things I would want to contribute to that as well is that um, sometimes loss of appetite or, 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 or elderly people not eating. I mean, patience is really the name of the game when you're a caregiver. Yes. Um, and, and some of the things that, some of the scenarios that you described, it, it really comes about because families and, and, and the elderly person have to ha have to have the difficult discussion. Yes. And they have to explain things back and forth. The person who was once in control needs to explain that this and this is my handicaps yes. or my deficiencies now that have become elder, uh, older, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is a hard, dis hard discussion, but it mm -hmm. also facilitates the care going forward yeah. because then you identify the gaps that mommy or daddy may have mm -hmm. and, and as a family you can address them yes. and therefore give a, a greater impact, more positive impact towards the overall health. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've noticed as well, um, you made a great point about dentition. Dental health is extremely important to elderly people and it compromises their, um, their ability to eat. eat. And sometimes I think that sometimes families and caregivers sometimes underlook or undercheck the dental health of a patient. Definitely. Um, the other part of it is sometimes people expect elderly people to feed themselves. Mm. Right. <laughs> sometimes an elderly person, because of the disease, they cannot hold an object. Yes. And um, food goes food. flying everywhere. Yes. And for, for a person or a woman or, 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 or elderly man who has been, a, a, it's, it's sometimes thick, it's sometimes embarrassing for them. Yes. So they would, they would sort of re, re, restrain from feeding and they certainly find it hard to ask someone to help feed them as well. Mm -hmm. So you as a caregiver have to look out for these things. Um, you have to look out for how they're eating or whether you need to assist them and you need to bring it into discussion and ease them into it, I think. That's right. Um, that's my observations mm -hmm. of, of dealing with elderly people. And um, making foods, you know, as we were saying before, you know, yeah. easier. So easier whether you're pureed, whether you're doing smoothies, you know, so that makes that a little bit easier for them to manage. Getting um, utensils and stuff. Exactly. Might Getting be utensils a little more bit suitable for, suitable elderly for them. Yeah. You know, Which is a little deficiency in Trinidad. Yes. Um, for elderly and people rheumatoid um, for the, the, right. the, the essential um, cutleries and so on. Yes, and you know, saying, um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of oh. dementia. Yeah. And I mean, that in itself is a big topic. Right. But one of some of the signs, you know, as people are getting older, of course, you know, they, they're losing some of these the cognitive abilities and yeah. dementia and so is not just um, people think about it only in terms of like memory loss yeah. but it's so much more because it's the whole brain that's affected yeah. so it's their ability to swallow it's their ability to coordinate yeah. so they can't um, properly chew they can't properly feed themselves they get yeah. very confused yeah. so if they're sitting at a table and there are all of these objects in front yeah. of them they can get confused they're not going to actually pick up on where they're supposed to be eating right. so it's a little practice tips would be having you know right. no clutter on your table right. having a plate or a bowl that can be easily seen yeah. so something that might be a little bit more colorful right. so that they can picture it um, utensils that are big and that they can actually hold and put in their mouth and you know along guiding them like those sorts of things right so um, I agree I agree and um, one of the big things that uh, from my experience working abroad as well right I mean with the elderly um, and I think there's a real deficiency of that in Trinidad and Tobago. And not only in the, in the nursing homes or the old people homes, as you call them here in Trinidad, or the care homes, but even with the families who are looking after the elderly people. Elderly people need to be stimulated. Yes. Um, when, I, when, I, when I saw some of the um, care homes that they have in, in, in other countries, more developed countries, in terms of economic development mm -hmm. um, and cultural development, not really. But in terms of economic development, that they have trips, they have programs, they have puzzles, they have plays, they have activities. Yes. So every person lives a high quality life mm -hmm. in a care home. Yes. Um, I didn't really observe that in my in, in working in Trinidad as much. Well, I um, have to invite you to the Sir Optimus home. I'm not criticizing the organization. <laughs> no, no, I've never been. Not at all. Um, well, but what I was going to say is that we try to. I mean, we're far from perfect. Right, but, but I put now the information this. there to the to the un uneducated or the undereducated yes. um, caregiver yes. to understand that 
you really have to be patient, not just towards, um, it's not a passive process of looking on the elderly person, sit down, watching TV, feed them the food, you take them to the toilet. It's, it's a lot more beyond that. Exactly. They need to have fun. Yes. And they need to go yes. out, they need to be socially engaged, they need to be mentally engaged. Definitely. And you have to find ways and means of doing that as well. And uh, you know, previously people will consider like dementia almost like a diagnosis of death. You yeah. know? But it's not. It's yeah. exactly what you're saying. People yeah. can live lives yeah. with dementia. I mean, yeah. there are ways of coping and, you know, strategizing. And as you're saying, keeping active, and mentally active is a big part of it. It's very frustrating for an elderly person as well to be having really good mental capacity and yet the body is not able to carry them yes um, and and they've been under stimulated they get yes. frustrated and angry yes and it's hard for example i have a 99 year old lady that i look after wow. and she remembers everything better than you know she yeah. tells me well, when in 2009 we did this 2010 you did that yes. we did this test we did that test she recited nursery rhymes reciting all the things that she learned in school yeah. we talk in reading the papers she's watching cricket but the body has completely been bed bound yes and um, without that constant stimulation i mean mm -hmm. look how, think about how frustrating she is of course so somebody and a lipo person's um, um, body status um, being slower and weaker does not necessarily relate to somebody who's slower or weaker mentally. That's right. And, and we have to appreciate patient, that as, example, as people who look after a Parkinson's it. patient, yeah. a yeah. Parkinson's patient, yes. for example, yeah. who, you know, might still be quite alert and with it, yeah. and but they aren't able to function as well. You know, right. they are one of the patients to me who, you know, exactly. that's a, a major problem with, you yeah. know. But I agree with you totally, Robin. Yeah. We need to have more elderly cares, carers yeah. where, you know, we need to have programs where yeah. we can act, you know, actually engage older yeah. folks. I mean, as you said abroad, they have these yeah. early centers yeah. where people can go and they can interact with yeah. each other we because puzzles, socialization. We, read, we have music, we go for trips. Yes, I, and socialization I, yeah. is such a big part of it. And of yeah. course, that was also severely af affected by COVID, right? Correct. So you saw this big mental decline in so yeah. many patients, you know, yeah. post COVID. And there, there's also the, now the fear and anxiety still yes. about going out because it was so, you know, pounded, you know, emphasized that um you know there were elderly people were most at risk yeah. so now you know there's still that hesitancy but i agree with you i think that we need as carers to recognize that these are a specific group of people that need compassion that yeah. need caring that need you know the same love that they gave to us yeah. um, as children that we need to be reciprocating and they need that time and care yeah. that it yeah. takes and it's hard work it hard is work. definitely hard all right. work. So, Renata, we need to take a second break. All yeah. right. Um, so, so, guys, yeah, we're here with Dr. Renata Ramsawak Lala um, talking about women's health. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into some hardcore uh, menstrual irregularities, menstrual problems, um, uterine health with, with the doctor. All right, guys, so please use the opportunity now to send in your questions, your comments. Just tell us how we're doing, how things are going. Um, give us your ideas, give us your ideas, your learnings, the benefit of your education as well to help us educate other people. All right, guys, we'll be back in one moment. <clears throat> When God sends a word, it serves a purpose. It serves a purpose because you serve a purpose. When you hear no, I want you to think next. So if, if God didn't let me do that, next. Jesus didn't call them to leave their boats. He called them to push out a little. It's a little decision so that I would rely on the grace of God. It's the blessing of both. Connect with ACTN The Voice on Facebook or Instagram at ACTN The Voice. ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. All right, guys, welcome back. We're here with Dr. Renata Ramsuak-Lala. So, Renata, um, 
another aspect of women's health. Um, how, uh, in terms of your office, like how would you as a doctor um, advise your, your patients who are entering the, um, the change of life as they call it, or menopause? Um, you would have like a 40, 48 year old lady or 49 year old lady coming into you saying, Doctor, am, am I going through menopause? Um, and, and what's happening to me? Yes. Uh, how, how, would you, how would you explain? How would you explain it to, to the patient? That's a great question, <laughs> and it's one that we hear all the time. All the time, yeah. So menopause is not really a clear-cut thing, as yeah. you know. It's yeah. really like a period of transition. Yeah. Um, so generally, what you would find is that women who would have had regular cycles yeah. now start becoming irregular. Yeah. So they may start seeing their periods, you know, further apart. Yeah. And you know, for some it might be lighter, or some it might be heavier. So right. it's so totally um, random at times yeah. because some women, you know, different people have different experiences. Yeah. But generally the idea is that the period, peri the period in between cycles start to come further and further apart yeah. till eventually um, the period stop. Yeah. And menopause is defined as um, uh, 12 months without having any cycles. Right. Now, still that is still unpredictable so yeah. um, the average age is 51 yes. but again it can vary it can be younger it can be older yeah. if you are still having your period at 54 then yeah. this is definitely a sense of time of concern and you need to get that checked right um, I generally tell my patients speak to their moms and you know see if there's any sort of pattern yeah um, in um, so the symptoms that you would start to experience most women experience flushes right and 80 percent of of women, menopausal women, will have flushes as the most common symptoms. Yes. If you Google it, as yeah. people in Trinidad tend yeah, to do, yeah. you will find um, a whole barrage of symptoms. Yeah. But hot flushes tend to be the number one symptom, yeah. which may be accompanied by palpitations. Yeah. So they may have, you know, heart, fast racing heartbeats. Yeah. Um, usually the flushes are short lasting. So it's for a few seconds or, you know, they, it may be accompanied by sweating or not. Right. So sometimes women say they go to bed and, you know, they wake up drenched yeah. or they feel very hot but for a short period of time and then they are okay yeah. so that sort of temperature changes tend to happen mm -hmm. there may be changes in mood mm -hmm. changes in sleep pattern so mm -hmm. people who would say that you know they always were able to sleep well before now find that they have interrupted sleep it may mm -hmm. be because of the temperature changes mm -hmm. um, and other vague symptoms you may have weight gain mm -hmm. there may be you know very strange there, there can be so many variable symptoms um, changes in focus and concentration is another one that um, women talk to me about right. so but for the most part menopause you know goes fairly well you know in yeah. terms of within a few years you know the hormones yeah. settle yeah. and you know it's it, it becomes routine right if you think that you are having issues mm -hmm. then you know I would say one try to do regular exercise. Mm -hmm. Exercise really helps to control the symptoms. Right. Again, diet is important, new, important mm -hmm. in terms of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And then there are also different, um, what we call um, herbal preparations. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these are like these natural um, you know, supplements that you can use and mm -hmm. usually they, there is an ingredient in it called black cohosh yes. and that is actually recognized as a treatment for, flush, oh, for flushes. Okay. So it's one that helps. Right. Um, if the symptoms are unbearable then yeah. definitely you will need to see a doctor and right. there is hormone replacement therapies that mm -hmm. can be used mm -hmm. which is a combination of estrogens and progesterones, you know, mm -hmm. that can be used to help reduce the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And is that tablets or how are tablets but mm -hmm. you can also have patches there are different mm -hmm. forms in which they are uh, can be delivered to the person mm -hmm. um, you know again we need to assess you of mm -hmm. course make sure you don't have any abnormal bleeding or anything mm -hmm. you know because of any underlying conditions mm -hmm. And then, of course, you'll have to look, to look at your family history of things like, or your personal history of things like if you have any clotting disorders, because mm -hmm. so that contraindicates menopause or like hormone replacement therapies. Correct. Then yeah. you have to do breast exams because right. there is an increased likelihood of having breast disease with mm -hmm. hormone replacement. Mm -hmm. So it's just something for us mm -hmm. to be aware of and to check. Yeah, you got to um, be careful. 
That's right. Yeah, taking yes. medication. I actually had a patient come to mm -hmm. me where mm -hmm. she had gone to see, she was complaining mm -hmm. of hair loss, which mm -hmm. is another thing that can happen. And hair you know, loss. Hair loss and thinning hair and her mm -hmm. goodly um, hairstylist recommended mm -hmm. some hormonal treatments. Gotta be careful. And that's right. I told her because she started bleeding. Yeah. So now in my mind, I knew what it was, but yeah. we still had to be safe yes. and do the investigations yes. and check and make sure because of course, yeah. menopo post menopause a bleeding can be a sign of something that's much more sinister yeah. so you have to be careful and had to be investigated mm -hmm. but you know um, we do have that tendency in Trinidad to yeah. listen to I'm glad everybody you it up so you safety of, of of, of yeah. different things, yeah. you know, so, and people, even herbal medications, you know, people yeah. seem to think that anything that's herbal or natural mm -hmm. is safe, mm -hmm. but even herbal medications can have side effects and so, so we need to be careful and have that discussion right. with the health provider. Right. Um, so, um, other than the exercise, the, the supplementation with the herbal medication, um, black copash, I think you said. Yes. And uh, possible um, hormone replacement therapy. Um, is this what happens next? Does the symptoms abate? Is it does? <laughs> do they get better? Or? Well, I think from the most part. Or is it a part, lifelong process? Or is it that people just get accustomed to it? I think for the most time, for the most part, it gets better. Gets better. Yeah, the symptoms get. I suppose less. because the 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 the, the, um, the gradient of the reduction in estrogen yes, is not as, as, as prominent. Steep. Yeah. Yes. So the body gets like most. You know, the body yeah. is pretty resilient. Yeah. So it gets used to it. Now there are people who do have symptoms. Yeah. even you know into maybe their 60s and so right. so I have had patients coming to me and saying you know they're still having these symptoms right. and usually what I'll do is investigate and make sure yeah. that there isn't anything else underlying that might be causing it you know we right. can't just assume it is menopausal especially when it's going on for a long period of time okay. but unfortunately yes some women right. do have menopausal symptoms into their 60s and so okay. um, Josh you have a question there you want to put it up? How can men husbands be more supportive in a natural menstrual cycle? Oh, <laughs> men's, uh, men, men or men, husbands? Men, men hus more than one husband. <laughs> be more supportive in a natural menstrual cycle. That's a real hard question to ask. Uh, I suppose it's education programs like this. Um, yeah. Well, I feel that, you know, education is the key. Yeah. I think that um, men I think men need to understand. To sorry to cut that, yeah, yeah, men need to understand women's health too. That's right. Um, and that, you know, there is premenstrual syndrome is something that's real. Yeah. You have um, variations on, in yeah. the hormones explain that happen. The men out there. <laughs> so women aren't necessarily being difficult. Now, yeah. there is premenstrual symptoms and there is actually premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, where the premenstrual sim symptoms can actually be a disorder. And this is when you find that women are, so it's not just a little moodiness or grumpiness prior to the period. It may be actual mood change like full-on depression yeah. and then of course all the premenstrual symptoms that come with it breast tenderness yeah. um, you know women who have I spoke about endometriosis earlier yeah. women who have endometriosis have very heavy painful periods that much yeah. more than just a normal period yeah. and may have um, you know pain with intercourse and intimacy may have chronic pelvic pains yeah. and this thing af this affects relationships yeah. so it means that men need to understand a little bit that what women go through that's actually a it's very good question isn't it yes it is <laughs> at first and reading it i was a little bit not sure where you're getting out of this question yes. but uh, hearing you explain it um, yes, I think it's all about relevant. it. It's and, actually a good question. And during this time, for a lot mm -hmm. of women, they feel tired. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, you know, you are, some women are anemic because of the blood loss. So yeah. that causes fatigue, causes them to be not able to focus as much, you know. And so they do need that uh, additional assistance from their husbands, you know, with childcare, or just being there emotionally for them, understanding that they are going through something and, you know, maybe help them, give them a heat pad help them make a cup of tea give them their meds that they might need I think it's you know understanding that it is something that is real um, you know in foreign countries now women actually get leave yeah. for their period of time yeah. because we recognize that there are women who have very difficult conditions That's they a great have point, medical right? conditions That's a great point. and you know 
women have to work they yeah. have to go to school they have to do all their different functions during this time yeah. and not for all women it's easy you know they may have headaches debilitating migraines or headaches yeah. during this time but i would say i mean i said it really given us such a fantastic point because it's not only men but i think employers society need to recognize because i've had some patients come the, over come into me over the years and they have as you described really painful heavy menstrual cycles yes. and sometimes i think this child have to go to school this child have exams coming up yes Yes. Nobody ever factored in that it's going to affect performance in oh, school. Yes. They could, no, I mean, yes. sometimes you have educated parents that look, we need to get the kids seen by a specialist, gynecologist. Yes. We need to, because this will affect them and their performance in school. Yes, right. um, as I said, work as well. Sometimes okay. people might, might un underappreciate that a woman's menstrual cycle it could be a reason for sick leave right that, that's right you know yeah. i grew up in a household and I'm, i don't know if my mom is listening but I'm sure she is <laughs> <laughs> where she would say to, to us my sister and i the queen of england has periods she yeah. functions you yeah. need to function as well and i think most young girls yeah. you know that would be the attitude you yeah. know that they would be given and they were right you know yeah. it is something a part of life yeah. that you recognize and you grow with and i think yeah. for the most part women have these sorts of approaches to the period it's yeah. part of life yeah. however they do have those who have distressing periods yeah. and they are the ones that you really need to have more um, focus on I know people who you know they can't function yeah. when they have their periods. and we have to advocate for those purposes as well to get medical attention yes it's not just something normal necessarily yes. normally yes. need to get medical help yes yes yeah you know, I will, I will share, you know, yeah. as a doctor, I had some issues like that. Yeah. And we would be on call. And on top of your, you have to go on top, top of your of game. On top of the game, and you know, you're busy, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I was in anesthetics. Yeah. And I remember one case, and I started to feel as if it was a really big trauma yeah. case. So you know how yeah. those things go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I felt as if I couldn't focus. And I felt to myself, why am I thinking? I'm feeling yeah. like I'm slow. Yeah. My brain isn't functioning and as well yeah. as it should and you know yeah. when I need to be clicking yeah. and I had one of the interns take my blood and my blood was actually six point something yeah. Yeah, 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 and you know so again it yeah. you know these are some things and as women we go on we you know we power through because yeah. this is what is expected yeah. but there really is you know so much that needs to be done you know yeah. in terms and of I, recognition I think yeah you're right I agree um, not that you're right, but you, you put forward the, the valid point and the, and the viewer who sent in the question put forward a valid point because it's something that um, sometimes as men we don't really think about our female colleagues from that point of view, <laughs> <laughs> that, they yes. may, that they may be going to menstrual cycle and so on and sometimes yeah, we have to just be a little bit more um, understanding. Yes. Um, and it's something I used to think about until a, an older colleague of mine, a male colleague, was like, Robin, you know, we can't be, you know, women are different, you know yes, what I mean? They have, yes. Um, right, yeah, Josh, put, up, put on the next question, sorry. How can fathers of girls be more supportive as they experience their first cycle? That's a really good question, boy. Yes, so. Doc, give us some suggestions <laughs> there. Um, well, first of all, it's going to be, you know, now um, girls go into puberty at a younger age yeah. from as early as nine or ten, yeah. you know, and this, I think, is a difficult thing for fathers to yeah. really appreciate, yeah. you know, um, it means because it's a signal, you know, your daughter going into what people consider womanhood. Yeah. So it's a bit of a big transition on both sides, you know, yeah. but I think just being there for them, I think it might be a bit of an embarrassment as because well for the daughter. Sometimes we have single fathers raising girls as well. Yes. Uh -huh. I remember um, in, you know, one, a single father actually uh -huh. bringing his daughter to me in the office because she started her period and there wasn't a mom in the picture. Yeah. So he was at a loss of what to do, you yeah. know, and, you know, so I think having the conversations, yeah. actually preparing your daughter yeah. for what's to come yeah. is a big part of it. Yeah. So we should move away from these things being taboo yeah. and trying to have these conversations earlier um, expect let, letting them expect do what to know so that at least takes away some of the um, embarrassment or the problem when it happens yeah. you know 
and it's a discussion for mommy and daddy with the daughter. I think traditionally, I think it's, I mean, this is, this is, I'm asking you. Yes. Yeah, I think traditionally we see like mommies do it and daddies sort of keep a distance, but are you saying that is a discussion for both parents to have with the, with the daughter? Oh yes, okay. definitely, definitely, yeah. because I mean, you're going to have, you know, both parents play very important roles yeah. in their daughter's life, yeah. and at least it's a way, I mean, to um, bond, yeah. to you know go through this change yeah. you know together i mean maybe yeah. they might feel a little bit there might be some embarrassment but that's yeah. part of the you know the growing up process as well yeah josh you have another question does the body stop producing estrogen or just produce less as women get gets older well post menopause that's mm. what really menopause is because mm -hmm. Um, you know, the ovaries now become mm -hmm. uh, um, basically atrophic, mm -hmm. so there's a much um, less production of estrogens. We do get some estrogens, if I remember physiology, from fat stores and so, yeah. but say, the most amount of estrogen would be produced by the um, ovaries, yeah. so definitely as you get older, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's going, and that's yeah. what causes the symptoms of menopause. Yeah. Its production is very, very, very limited. Yes. Um, it's just not producing any more estrogen. Yes, yes. Um, so that's what the hormone replacement yeah. does. Huh? It yeah. helps to replace that estrogen that's lost. Yeah. And you know, again, nutrition, you know, there are certain foods that are high in estrogens, right. like things like sweet potatoes, for example, right. you know, soya, those things have a little more estrogen. Right. So for women in menopause, those are things that they can use, you know, to at least help. Yeah. Um, good answer there, Doc. Good answer. <laughs> So um, we've, we've come to the end of the program. Um, it was an enjoyable program. Um, I think you gave a different slant, which is, which is what I like from the hardcore medical pathophysiological stuff. You explained a lot of, a lot of um, medicine as a general practitioner, things that we don't normally think about and that are not normally um, heavily pushed or communicated to the public. Um, especially about body image, eating disorders, the menstrual, the questions were fantastic um, in terms of the, how to support women um, menstrual irregularities. So I think we touched on a lot of the topics that we wanted to touch on. Um, and I'd just like to thank you, uh, Dr. Renata, for coming out tonight in the program and um, sharing with the, with the audience at home. It was definitely my pleasure. <laughs> I hope that I really contributed. You did. And it was such a pleasure being yeah, here. I enjoyed it, special. So did I. All right. So, um, Guys, um, that's it for tonight. Um, let's like to thank Dr. Ramsawak Lala again, and also to thank you at home um, for contributing your wonderful questions. For, for, we hope we entertain you tonight, and I um, just want to wish you all at home a very good night, pleasant evening, and we'll see you again next week. Um, you have been watching Your Health, Your Choice. Our, um, our episodes are also available. The full series are also available on YouTube, ACTN, Your Health, Your Choice. All right, guys, so I am Dr. Roman Ryan. Um, your host and Dr. Joshua, um, Joshua DeMatos is your director and we wish you all the very best for tonight. Take care.